Welcome, everybody. It's such a treat to have you here this morning at the Fog Fair, and a huge thanks to the Modern Art Council for supporting this talk and for all of you uh, for your contributions to SFMOMA and our education programs. And I'm really thrilled to bring out two amazing people, uh, Lori Laser, who is a San Francisco native, and Stephen Powers, not a native, native enough. <laughs> and Stephen Powers, who's based in New York and Philadelphia. Um, we've got a lot of different things to talk about today, uh, including Steve's work and, and Lori's work uh, in San Francisco and in each of their respective communities dealing with art and art in public. Um, but I'll introduce both of them, and then we'll kind of hop into a little bit of a discussion and save some time for questions, which I hope you'll all have plenty of. Um, Lori Laser is the co-founder and co-director, alongside Daryl Smith, of the Luggage Store Gallery, the 509 Cultural Center, and the Tenderloin National Forest, which is a community commons for public art and education. She's worked as a freelance photographer from 1975 to 1990 and served as a newspaper columnist for the award-winning Tenderloin Times. She's taught at SFAI, the San Francisco Art Institute, and developed the Mentoring Shortcuts program at the Luggage Store for new and emerging curators of color. She's a recipient of a Goldie Award from the SF Bay Guardian, a Tender Champ Award from the Tenderloin Times, and was an artist in residence at the Headland Center for the Arts. Since 1987, Lori, along with Daryl Smith, have curated over 200 visual arts exhibitions organized thousands of performances, and co-founded and produced the annual In the Street Theater Festival, which featured public, interactive, visual, and performing arts. Um, for that time, over 30 years, Lori has been a fierce advocate for art and public in the Tenderloin and mid-market neighborhoods and all over San Francisco, and has been dedicated to finding and creating opportunities and programs for artists and communities. The Luggage Store Gallery, which many of you, I hope, are familiar with, has been the epicenter of many breakthrough artists and has facilitated public murals by Margaret Kilgallen, Barry McGee, Osjemios, Johanna Pothing, Simon Norris, Andrew Schultz, R Ricardo Ricci, hmm? Alicia McCarthy is on my list, <laughs> Chad Hasagawa, Claire Rojas, and many others, and most real most recently, the brilliant new work by Alicia McCarthy, which is on 7th and Market Street, which I hope you all can go and see. She's currently working on murals with Stephen Powers and Tauba Auerbach, coming potentially this year. Um, Lori's role in shaping the art that has emerged out of San Francisco in the past 30 years cannot be overstated. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm equally excited to have the New York City-based um, and Philadelphia legend, the artist Stephen Espo Powers, here with us today. Also uh, an empresario. Born and raised in Philadelphia, Powers began his art practice as a graffiti artist under the moniker Espo in the 1980s, gained global renown for his graphic style, and has been dedicated himself, has dedicated himself to his art practice since 1999. He focuses on the language of signs, typography, and the visual clutter of our everyday. And his work riffs on our emoticon-driven culture, and his lyrical witticisms capture our collective unease with the rapidity and often vapidity of instantaneous communication. Power's work reminds us of the importance of human connection and the crush of capitalism, the inevitability of time, and the way that we craft and recraft our own personal narratives. His work has been shown at the Venice and the Liverpool Biennials, as well as numerous exhibitions all over the world. And in 2007, he was the recipient of a Fulbright Scholar Award, which he used to explore the political murals in Ireland, creating a project um, in Belfast, uh, which eventually became the Love Letter Mural Project. Um, these love letter mural projects explore the complexities and rewards of relationships, and in Phil Philadelphia, a series called A Love Letter for You spans 50 walls along the elevated train in West Philly. The Love Letter Project has now grown to 10 cities, spanning the globe from Sao Paulo to South Africa. Powers was recently the subject of a solo exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum, uh, titled Coney Island is a Dreamland, 
to a seagull and has published five books, including his newest publication compiling the last six years of global public art projects called A Love Letter to the City. I'm thrilled to bring Stephen out to the Fog Fair and beginning in May at SFMOMA, we'll be installing a new site-specific commission um, that Stephen's currently working on, titled Daymaker. So keep that in mind coming, coming in May. So we've, we've titled this talk, A Love Letter to San Francisco. I'm wanting to bring up topics present in Stephen's work, in the work that Lori's done. Um, we have a few slides, some um, images of yes. projects that, that Lori's contributed to, followed by projects that Steve's been working on. They're just kind of kind of cycle in the background for a little while. That's the doorway to my church right there. That's what it looks like. I walked in <laughs> to this door, I don't know, 1990 something. So that door was is the doorway of the luggage store gallery. This is the doorway. And this is the facade of luggage store gallery. And the work that you've produced, Lori, uh, and the work that you've produced, Stephen, have a kind of commonality, and you've even worked together over the years. One of those commonalities being uh, responsiveness to what I consider kind of our collective, our age of collective anxiety. Uh, I think we're all kind of palpably feeling a lot of different things percolating into the art world, but not all artists are as responsive to it. Not all curators or directors of institutions are as responsive to it. So I think I'm, I'm curious from both of you, what does it mean for the artist or for the community that's the audience to create art in the age of collective anxiety? I'll go. I, um, a, a lot of what I've learned about public art and making, making public art, I learned from Laurie. And Laurie, uh, Laurie's run the luggage store for all these years. I learned that from Laurie. If you can read that, it says, you have one new message. Yeah, it says, you have one, says, you have one new message, you know. This is a Stephen Powers original. And I have this thing with petroleum products, so I make these things that won't last. I think it's ephemeral and it's a true story. And my attitude has changed, you know. Now I have two new messages for you. So, there's that. But, I walked into the luggage store, I saw Lori had a community of really interesting artists that I, I wanted to be like, I respected, and I, I, I admired, and I got along with. But she was also starting, and she also maintained a, a place in a community for doing public art projects. It was always, the luggage store existed as an enclosed space, but it was always out, always in the middle of some kind of outreach. It was always, working on the public and working in private to create a space for people to, uh, to see art and to, to make art and to interact with art. It's really hard to find time between home and work and work and home to fit art into your life. So it's especially now, as, as fast as, as the times are, it's never been more important to create opportunities for people to interact with art on their way home or on their way to work. And the luggage store has been doing that for forever. And it's, uh, I saw a project she did with Margaret Kilgallen. I saw a project Laurie did with Margaret Kilgallen in the Tenderloin in the 90s. And I thought that is so great. There's no other place in the world that you could do something like that to the same degree except for Coney Island. So. You want to think that the Tenderloin and Coney Island are, they're actually the same place in some ways. I want to get to your project that you worked on in, in Coney Island, but I'm curious, Lori, from you, how through the luggage store and through the Tenderloin National Forest, you've kind of used art to build community or filled a, filled a gap that needed nurturing. Okay. Well, first of all, um, do I have to use it? Yeah. Okay, first, <laughs> first of all, um, one thing that we do intentionally... Can everybody hear? A little louder. One thing... Hello. One thing that we intentionally do at the gallery is to leave spaces um, not curated 
So instead of like having a year's worth of exhibitions, we intentionally leave spaces to be able to respond to things that are happening in the world. Can we get and Lori's mic up a little bit? Can you hear me? I can hear you. I'm sitting next to you. I like to mumble, and I, I like to be in the shadow. But anyway, so we leave intentional spaces to be able to respond to things that are happening in the world. And the first time that we showed Stephen was one of those shows, and it was called 5,000 Trees in response to 9-11. And that was Steve's first show at the luggage store we, where he did a giant T-shirt installation. And talk about um, crazy times of anxiety. Post 9-11 was one of those crazy times of anxiety. I'd love you to talk about that T-shirt. Uh, but that's, I, we have differing um, views of how we first met. <laughs> That's true. But <laughs> when we did the show at, it was October, she mounted a show in San Francisco with myself, Cheryl Dunn, and Tony Ausler. And Jacqueline Humphreys. And Jacqueline Humphreys, thank you. And, you know, it, did, it was really raw. It was a really raw time to make art, and nobody was really ready to go back to that kind of work. But Laurie stepped up and, and offered a space, and we all, all four artists had something, we all had something in hand to show and, and to talk about. In my situation, I had collected, the day after 9-11, I think it was 9-12, I was on, I have a studio not far from the World Trade Center, and it's right close to Canal Street. Canal Street, as we all know, is a bustling um, commercial thoroughfare for counterfeit goods, um, illicitly made goods, and a lot of t-shirts. So, Wall, Wall Street was closed, but Canal Street was open, and it was like the white blood cells of capitalism were flooding into the open wound of Manhattan, and they were selling 9-11 commemorative t-shirts on Canal Street the day after 9-11. And the first t-shirt that I noticed, that I bought, said, Attack on America, I can't believe I got out. And I bought that shirt, and I bought what ended up being like a hundred more shirts. Tourists were flooding downtown, wanted to go to the site, and they bought these t-shirts. And they were really strange and really bizarre, but they were also people needing to do something with their lives, people needing to make money, people taking advantage of a terrible situation to do something terrible to make money. There are still guys down around what used to be Ground Zero, which is now the world, then and again, the World Trade Center. They're selling these little photo books, souvenir books of like the day of the attack, just like printing like carnage, you know, explosive photos and they're terrible, but there's a, a living to be made hustling bootleg 9-11 t-shirts. Lori, so, was that part of your agenda with the luggage store was to do exhibitions that were commentating comment, commenting on the kind of struggle, the, the issues? Well, I don't think we had an intention. Our intention is to leave space for what people are feeling and thinking, and that's what came up, you know. And I'm going to pass around a book in a little while, which I'd like everyone to th uh, maybe jot a few notes or doodles on what you're feeling and thinking, because it is terribly anxiety-ridden period, but it was the first. I'll talk about that later. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. So I hung up the t-shirts in her gallery um, like, a, like, I, like they were being sold in Canal Street. So it was just a rack of t-shirts that were floor to ceiling. And I remember you being horrified, but I think, you know, that it was horrible. It was horrible to look at. Um, I, there's, you know, it was kind of amazing to see all four artists had a response, and it was kind of, it was amazing that we had a place to respond to, that we could do it here. And then people came to the, to the gallery, they stole shirts, they took postcards, they thought it was like theirs for the taking, and I wanted them to take it. It, it made it a little complicated to keep it fresh day after day. But so it was kind of building a community, but also <laughs> <clears throat> encouraging people it, to, to kind of walk away with what you people do what they're going to do. I think, you know, that's, it's great when that happens. It's not, yeah. there we go. I don't remember how, that. How terrible is this? Um, 
they were like two for, it was a, if you, it was a deal you got three for ten dollars. That was a good one. But uh, yeah, they're they're horrible and they're important and they're horrible. So so time is a vicious circle. Yeah, a, here we are again. A flat circle. They oh, say. here we so are in Coney Island. Again. We're kind of here again. <laughs> um, and so I thought Coney Island and the Tenderloin are really like sister cities. Like they're both by the water, filled with dangerous and crazy and beautiful people. They both advertise pleasure. They both have exciting rides that will kill you. Uh, and <laughs> They both have these marginalized communities that needed to be served and would be grateful to be served. So that's why we, it was a perfect fit to transport Margaret and Laurie's project to Coney Island, and it worked fabulous. Laurie, can you tell us what that project was, how that came about? Oh, the project was called Signs of the Times, and we were trying to do as much public art as possible in the Tenderloin, and basically it was, the intention was to help small business owners who couldn't afford to have signage in the Tenderloin. And I asked Margaret, and I also worked for the Tenderloin Times at that period of time, which was a, a newspaper printed in three languages, Cambodian, v Vietnamese, and English, and it was pretty amazing. And um, so I invited Margaret, um, and I uh, chose three interns for her. We went around the neighborhood to meet uh, small business owners and organizations that didn't have signage, you know, that, you know, you would not, never know what was going on in their space, and that's how that began. So they painted very clear, simple, elegant, beautiful signage, and, you know, I don't, she could paint, she painted those maybe in an afternoon, a few days, she did Margaret do sketches and then return with sketches and get sketches approved? Or? Well, what happened is we went around and met the people and um, we interviewed them and then she developed some sketches with uh, the interns that I chose for her, who were Stella Lai and Alberto Rangel. And um, they took it from there. I made the introductions and then Margaret and Stella and Alberto took it from there. What do you think is the, you know, the important thing about the history of sign painting to preserve. It was, felt like it was a dying art that needed your help to be revitalized through Margaret's work and through Stephen's work. Well, I didn't feel like it was a dying art. I just felt like people couldn't afford to make signs. It's yeah. kind of like um, artists who didn't have money couldn't even make slides to show galleries you know, yeah. back in the day. Now we have digital, but you had to be of a certain um, class or something to have your work documented. But anyway, that was the motivation, was to help some of the people in the Tenderloin to, to promote what they were doing. And in a way, just beautify the city. So the fabric of the city is all about all the things that are amassed and layered, all the signage, the billboard, the storefronts, and, and what you were noticing in the Tenderloin, and Stephen, what you were noticing in Coney Island was that these signs were starting to fall into disrepair, and then people weren't feeling enlivened by the city itself, or the place. Yeah. That's true. When I met Margaret, it was one thing we could talk about all day long was signage. And it was just amazing to see her work and see like, oh, it's that sign from down the block. Like, she would paint like all the signs around the luggage store, all these beautiful, perfect, hand-painted from the 50s, from the golden era of sign painting. She gravitated towards it and formed everything that she did. And I landed in San Francisco and I was obsessed with all that stuff. So then, you know, I was friends with Barry first, but when me and Barry ran out of stuff to say, Margaret was there and we could talk about signs. And it, it can, the conversation go on for another 12 hours. So finding Margaret and finding somebody else that was really into signs probably led me into being obsessed with signs and continuing to make signs to this very moment. Um, I also found a musical group that was using banjo in a contemporary musical song, uh, Magnetic Fields. So it was an even trade. She got me further into signs and I got her into Magnetic Fields. So, but signs are like this really great, perfect example of, you know, elegance and urbanity and it's, it's all the way downtown, but it's all the way uptown at the same time. Like, and an, ex an extension of the sign is really the mural, which yeah. you both have been prolific in either producing or facilitating. 
Um, Stephen, your, your project in Philadelphia, we had a, a great opportunity to bring some SFMOMA folks out, and you gave us a tour along the elevated. Thank you for coming. It's such a thrill when out-of-towners come to Philadelphia. It's like, <laughs> we're this like desert island, and when people show up, we, I get really excited. Yeah. It was great to have a bus full of, of you to come out. So thank you again. And, and Laura, you just completed this Alicia McCarthy project on 7th and Market, which is tremendous. How did that come about? Well, basically, Daryl and I have been um, trying to find walls forever, you know, to, you know, it's pretty depressing in some of the areas. It, um, and also in the Tenderloin and Mid-Market, it's kind of like um, everything's coming at you, like, in a, in a little bit of a violent way, you know. There's, two, there's signs, there's neon, there's, there's, I don't know, it's just, I have to shut up. Anyway, we try to create opportunities to find uh, more elegant and maybe things that would bring people to have a pause or something, to pause instead of the busyness. And um, we approach different building owners to ask permission if uh, we could use their wall. And then we would um, present, um, we would ask different artists to present some sketches and then go to the building owner and that's how that happened. So um, the wall that Alicia did was a, a lot of artists wanted to use that wall and we had a relationship with the owners of that building. So we approached them and um, we showed them a bunch of different artists work and they wanted Alicia and we worked with Alicia, you know, for the weaves that she does. And um, we decided on the giant weave instead of a more minimal one. It's a beautiful piece if you see it. And I right wanted, now- I wanted that wall. I didn't have anything for it, but I, I wanted that wall. But you, you have a wall coming to you. I know, but I wanted that one. <laughs> but it's, I'm, I'm glad Alicia got it. She did, she did much better. Oh, I know why. I know why I didn't get it. Um, but I'm really glad Alicia got it. It looks really great. <laughs> um, we've got some, some drawings of yours, uh, oh, Steve, in the background, cycling through. and. There's something that's really compelling about the way that you render human emotion um, as these kind of wicked, smart, small narratives tying into, yes, our collective unease, but also ideas of heartache, loneliness, exhaustion, mundanity. Poor Charlie Brown. Now he's a hostage. Charlie Brown never gets a break. Now he's <laughs> bound in duct tape. Terrible. What do you what do you think is is happening with our modes of communication these days? Are, and we're, are we enter, entering a post-verbal era where we're just using emojis? Wouldn't that be great if this was a post-verbal era? <laughs> <laughs> How exciting would that be? Uh, it, it, it's really kind of amazing to see. Language, I think, is getting a lot more elastic, and it, it's going to it, it just with the proliferation of BRB and BRT and OMW and LOL and and BLTs and the rest. Like just the condensing <laughs> of language, the streamlining of language, obviously the proliferation of emojis. And when I looked at this. I started like drawing, making drawings like this in 2002. And as soon as I did, I said, there's already something like this. It's called, they call them emoticons and they call them emojis in Japan. Emojis were invented in Japan in 1999. That's all. At the time in America, we were doing emoticons with like the equal sign and the parentheses bracket making the smiley face. That was the time. That was great. But in Japan, they already had the symbols and, and I could see that's where it was going to go. We we're going to move to this completely symbolic structure of language. But at the same time, it was going to be really surface and it was going to be really just ephemeral and not getting deep at all. So I guess I was looking for a way to make deep emojis, try to like get closer to the sinew and the bone a little bit. Like if Maggie Smith wrote emojis, what would they look like? You know, you know who Maggie Smith is? Um, of course you do. And I don't know. It's just, if these are the tools, and every artist, I think, comes online in their time, 
And they have a set of tools that's in front of them. And it might be pastels or marble or cell phones or fax machines or... And for me, it just seemed... I didn't, almost didn't want to do it, but it felt appropriate to go this way. And I, I can draw really good pictures. Like, I can draw a picture that looks just like you, Joseph. But the reality is, it. that's not my need. I don't, I don't feel like there's a real need for that. Um, I think what there's a need for is, for me, is direct communication. It's figuring out something in myself, figuring out a way to communicate it, if it lands on people. When people laugh or people cringe, I had a friend of mine whose mom was taking him to rehab and she stopped, she was like putting him in the cab and she turned and stopped to me and said, I love the paintings you do that make me laugh and they make me cry. And I, I said, that's really sweet of you. And her son's like, I, we know, we love those. Take me, take me to rehab, get me out of here. <laughs> so, and nothing really has done it for me since. Like, Do you think that of, there's a real need for people to laugh and cry? Right there's a now? real need for people to laugh and cry. And laugh, cry. And, and angry, laugh, and ugly cry. Because how else are we going to cope, really? So I, I, You're not I, coping I, When I look at, at your work, I'm, I'm like, this is a coping <laughs> mechanism for it's me. It's a coping... Me- I'm here to make coping mechanisms. Yeah. There you go. The cigarette and the lighter. What a combination. What a cute <laughs> couple they are. <laughs> It's not going to end well, but it'll be a great... They're here for a good time, not a long time. <clears throat> pigeons, pigeons mate for life. They are... When they get together, they stay together, so... How much of your work is autobiographical? 100% Is that 100 or 0? It's on 100% <laughs> So some of, these, some of these murals are part of the Philadelphia series. This is in Dublin. It says, oh. baby is crying, rent all spent. The car got towed because I parked in a space that said, don't park here. Lost the remote. There's no hot water. The fridge is empty. But I ordered food. I don't have any money, but I ordered food. So please come home. And it's called Baby Mama's Day. And that's for my baby mama. Um, if you were here, I'd be home now in the refrigerator magnets. Um, I made that when my son was, I guess, three years old. So that's where that came from. So a lot of them are... A lot of them about are embrace, autobiographical. Enduring love or the, enduring. the kind of um, trials and tribulations of, of romance trials or partnership. And, trials and tribulations. Not just between two people, but maybe between people and the city itself. Whoever, whoever whatever, gets you through the night. Mm-hmm. In a way, Lori, what you do is also prompt this kind of love affair with the city itself. Do you think so? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Okay. <laughs> I, I imagine that without the luggage store gallery, there wouldn't have been a tremendous venue for uh, what we now consider the mission school. You know, that, that, that you birthed a space uh, that allowed artists to kind of come to terms with those anxieties and produce work and be shown kind of of the people and for the people. You know, that, that you were operating in a... Uh, on, on a level of accessibility for the general public that, Steve, your work also hits. And that's obviously why you guys connected. Well, yeah, accessibility is a big issue. And also... Just hold it close. You can... Uh, Lori, just... Accessibility yeah. and being responsive and, and trying to listen. And one thing that I've adopted in the age of anxiety and whatever is I do silent meditation <laughs> retreats. So you were saying post-verbal emojis. I go on three a year for 10 days where I don't talk at all. It's really amazing. (laughs) Sounds good. I invite you all. (laughs) Yeah. I think we could all use a little bits of moments of silence. We can do it. We've been doing it at the luggage store. We had a show called Second Sleep um, by Gabby Miller, and she created about 100 meditation benches. And we had like a pop-up meditation hall there. And during the opening, I said, okay, everybody be quiet. And everybody got on a bench because we need to calm down and ground and be quiet because things are so crazy. And they've been crazy. And they get everything changes. If that's not art in the age of collective anxiety, I'm not sure what is. So. That, that's I'm it. the collective anxiety she's, right she's, here. she's serving it to us. Mm-hmm. You know? White hairs. 
<laughs> so, Steve, I'm, I'm really excited that we're working on a commission project with you. Um, you've been thinking a little bit about what it, what it might be. Do you, you have any thoughts you might want to share with us? No, no. <laughs> Keep it a secret. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's one of these things that I, I, I guess I got to feel out. Um, I, I have to have the tactile, side, the tactile sensation of like feeling the wall and feeling, feeling the place. When we, uh, all these projects that we do, it's, it's really hard because we line up funding, we get grants, all on the basis of, I don't know what I'm going to do yet. Like, you have to trust that we're going to enter into this space where I'm going to figure it out as I go along. And it was really the cause of a lot of institutional grant-giving anxiety when we approached that the first time. But we delivered, and we always deliver. We listen, and we talk to people in these neighborhoods, and we get a sense of who they are and what they're really going through. And we try to figure out how to speak in their language to them and for them. You know, I liken what I do to setting up a sound system, getting the mic level right, and then just letting somebody else speak. Like, I'll kind of mold the words into a shape that that can fit the wall and I can paint effectively. But for me, I, it's funny because I come out of graffiti, which is all like, me, 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 me. And now I'm in a space where I'm painting you, 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 and I'm trying to put you in that place and not worry about it so much. And I can do that now because I had like my fill of being me as a teenager. So it's, it's great to, to be there for other people now. Um, yeah. I think it's, uh, what I say is, if I write my name on a wall, you're going to get mad. But if I write your name on a wall, you're going to be happy. So that's, that's where I'm going. How have you noticed the community of West Philadelphia change with your mural project? You know, a lot of the issues that come up in, in painting mural and doing like big mural projects is developers want to call me to like come in and like gentrify a neighborhood. Um, we just, you know, and it happens, it, it used to be a building, but now it's like entire neighborhoods, and it'll probably be a city at some point where they say, come and do the branding for this new Amazonia, we're calling it, I don't know, we're still working on the title, but, and I end up just having a dialogue with the people that are being displaced, or, and their voices end up coming to the fore, and being like, what's put in that place. That's what happened in Brooklyn and other places, but in Philadelphia, we created all these walls. We, we painted an entire neighborhood, and then we left. We didn't take advantage of it. We just kind of left town. I went to do other things. So the walls end up being there as a, as a resource and as a point of pride for the locals. Like the locals, they, they get their money out of it. They make t-shirts about it. They, you know, react to the tours. And it's just kind of like this resource that stays in the neighborhood generating positive attention for the neighborhood and occasionally generating some financial remuneration for the neighborhood. And I'm, I'm off on the next thing. So it's really, that's, that's a sweet plum, I think, that I didn't really anticipate, but it happened. So... All these walls in Philly are still there. People are figuring out ways of like making money from the attention that's paid to those walls. And I'm off doing something else. So, so you were deal. inspired by kind of your, your love for West Philadelphia in particular. In the I am West Philadelphia born and raised. On a playground I spent <laughs> most of my days. There it is. Most of them. I have a question for both of you that you're probably gonna answer very differently which is, why do you love San Francisco? All right, she's looking at me. I love the rain. I love Carl the Fog. I love the food. I love the architecture of the hills, the people. No, people's like four, 14th on the list. But 
My, my beautiful sister has been here for, I think, 25 years. Is that right? Something like that. So um, I've been coming back to stay with her and to be near her and, you know, be near this whole community of artists that I love and admire and try to drink their water. You know, it really is like all these really awesome artists and people that I can't get enough of. And I'm just trying to eat their food and drink their water and try to like get in their heads a little bit. In San Francisco, you know, I know you feel like it's changed and it's, it's not what it used to be, but it's still so beautiful. And all the possibilities are still here, which is really great because in New York, the possibilities are going fast. They'll be replaced. I'm, I'm sure of it. Like, new possibilities are emerging. But it's very interesting to see, like, the character just get sucked out of New York and Los Angeles in a lot of ways. But it's still here. What do you think, Lori? I guess what I love most about San Francisco is the ocean and the fog. It's become my friend. You know, I didn't like it for many years. And um, mostly what I... I guess what I was drawn to San Francisco was for the experimentation, for people like me who came here to, because there was so much space to be able to create things that um, maybe they couldn't do where they were from. And I'm from New York City, which is huge, and San Francisco felt like a little tiny place where I could manifest some of my ideas. And, um, and I felt like a lot of the people that I met and worked with were manifesting and working to do their dreams and their ideas, and it's, a, it's changing. But yeah, there's possibilities, and there's, there's always a possibility for change. If, if, if I didn't feel like that, I couldn't be anywhere. <laughs> Amazing. I want to open it up to you guys for some questions for Steve and for Lori. Um, we've got a microphone that's going to come around. Laura has a mic. You can yell or sing, that's fine. We've done both. When the lights yes. go down Stephen in the, the book. city. Oh, thank you. I, I it passed on? it off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Hi. Hi. I've got one for Stephen and for Lori. So Stephen, I'll ask you first. Um, how long does it take you to create your various works? And at what time of the day or night do you do them? And are there, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Midnight. I like working after a cup of coffee. I have one more. Um, daytime, daytime is, whenever the light is good is the best, but I'm, I'm not adverse to working under moonlight, uh, halogen, parking lot lights a lot. I, I can paint really anytime, but you know, like most people, 70 degrees, warm, southwest breeze, <laughs> on the cool side of the wall, it's, it's really, really nice. I painted a wall in North Carolina, in, in Norfolk. I, it's, not in the, it's not in the lineup here. But I painted a, a portrait of Alan Iverson being braided by his mom, Ann Iverson, at a game. It's a really legendary moment in history. But I was able to paint. The weather was so good, the light was so good, and everything was working. It was supposed to be a wall that was going to take four days, and I painted it in like 11 hours. And it was as good as it'll ever be. And I, I went home. You got into the zone. I got, and I got home before the opening, which I've never done. The, and contrast that with the, the second time I showed at the luggage store was part of a three-person show with Talba Auerbach and Joe Amrine. And I didn't finish the work before the opening. I worked through the opening. And he worked with his... You had the, yeah, I had a mask the little on. respirator and... So, so focused with so many people in the game. I was really impressed. But she would stick her head around to get my attention, like be come between me and the painting. She gave me this glare of like, <laughs> what are you doing? You should be talking to people. No, we have a different memory. <laughs> that's, that's good. Because and I had, oh, sorry. I had someone downstairs who was holding people back because you were still working. Right, that's one what my, it was. One of my former students, Imael, he did a performance downstairs so we can stall everybody from coming up. So, and Lori, for you, um, you had mentioned before about getting permission from the people who own the buildings. Uh, is there ever art done where you don't get a permission, or is there anything from the city that has to happen, or you just, it's just case per case? 
Um, there's a lot of different situations, but we used to do non-permissional work, but um, um, now we do mostly permissional work. And um, it's, a, you know, after you, you approach the building owner and you, you show them a design, and depends where your money comes from, like if it's from the city, which um, Alicia McCarthy's mural was from the Office of Economic and Workforce Development, and we had to go through the Art Commission to approve the, uh, the design. And um, it's not so complicated if you're not getting city funding. And we, we actually seek community approval. And for instance, we did one mural um, on 6th and Howard Street, and we were working with Barry McGee. It was his first permissional piece, and we couldn't get permission from anybody because we actually opened the process up to residents and everybody had a problem with something he was, that there was a broken bottle, there was like somebody drunk or whatever it was, everybody had problems. We finally found one space. But, but we learned from that because there's a balance between how much, you, how much input you can let in and... The community is very opinionated in San Francisco. You could have one person shut down a, an entire project. Do we have another question? Shoot. Lizette, can you repeat it in the mic? Thanks. Hello. Oh. Yeah. How have you seen public art change since 2016? Uh, I, I got to say, it's, it's been really great to see. I got to really, the, the first thing that comes to mind is Hank Willis Thomas and the Four Freedoms Project. He did 50 billboards across the states, crowdfunded. And every billboard is, is excellent, speaks to the moment, completely relevant. It's probably a shock in some of these small towns when some random billboard that's not, not anything you'd expect kind of pops up on the horizon. So it was, uh, that's, you know, I think that's what we're seeing is we're seeing really smart, the, the stuff that's working is the stuff that's really smart and of the moment and reactive. You know, and not only reactive, but proactive. And can I say something? Also on the other side of that, we, like recently in San Francisco, we removed the early days uh, monument, which was in Civic Center, which is a racist monument for Native Americans. And that's post 2016. And I think the initiative to get that going was uh, partially due to 45. A lot of people are kind of waking up and looking around and yeah. seeing that we've been living with evidence of injustice all around us. Correct. And I think that's definitely manifesting in new public art, but also a reconciliation of old public art. I, yeah. I, I, Things that don't serve. Yeah. I was going to say that. <laughs> Silver lining? I was going to say maybe? everything. <laughs> got a couple questions over here. If we can get a mic. You have very clever sayings and almost poetry you. on your art and your murals and your um, public art. Where do you get the inspiration for this? I live life. <laughs> and I, I, it really is, I, I draw every morning on the train and a lot of it's just uh, a story I told them that I'll tell you. Sorry if you've heard this before. I drew a, a drawing, a, a therapist called me and said, you got to get in here. No, she said, <laughs> she said, I, I, me, my wife and I have bought this drawing of yours and we want you to explain it. And the drawing is a, a therapist couch and a therapist, but the, the, patient on the couch is a balled up piece of paper, like tightly balled up piece of paper. And the person on the couch is like a stenographer pad with a pen that's writing on another pad. And the, there's like a, a word balloon over the crumpled up piece of paper that shows a book, like a really momentous like novel, great American novel. Like the crumpled up piece of paper is, has this dream of being a, a, a novel. And the therapist, as a thought balloon over the therapist's head, that's just the same crumpled up piece of paper, but smoothed out. 
There's still a lot of wrinkles in it, but it's better than it was. It's not crumpled up anymore. It's, it's retained, it's, it's going back to maybe a flat shape. And the therapist asked me to explain this drawing, and I can't. Like, I, I said, I thought of it. I thought of this crumpled up like, piece of paper with a lot of problems, and this therapist that can't do anything about it. I was like, I don't know what it means. I was like, even explaining it sounds dumb. So that's the, that's the lesson I still haven't learned. Like, I shouldn't explain this stuff. Like, I, I think it, I feel it, I write it down in a flush of emotion or detachment or sometimes cringing at what I'm thinking. But all I can tell you is, like, I'm a radio. And it comes in and out. Sometimes it's a good song, and sometimes it's a terrible song. Most of the time, it's static. But once in a while, something good comes through. I think that. Thank you. That that drawing is, you know, it's it's highlighting the irony that sits in between perception and reality, where the balled up piece of paper <laughs> thinks it can be a novel, and the therapist taking notes only can imagine it as a. I was straightening out the piece of paper. <laughs> yeah, maybe we get you on the ironing board. We'll start there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But that's why it's great to have a curator nearby to... <laughs> Got it. Crucial. Uh, Did you guys all hear that? Yeah, that's what are some crazy stories yeah. Stephen had growing up doing graffiti? I hate questions like this, but I love the questioner, so I'm gonna answer the question. I was in Paris writing graffiti, you know, which is already too, too fun. And I just, you know, Paris is, at the time, you know, was covered in graffiti. I, I wasn't doing, I like to write on things that are already falling down and abandoned anyway. And what I was writing on was definitely falling down and abandoned. But I got about a block or two away from the graffiti, and I saw two guys running up to me, and I didn't even connect them to the graffiti I wrote. I just thought they were two guys trying to rob me. So I started fighting these two guys and running away from these two guys, and then I saw a car chasing me, and it was like, a, 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 it wasn't a, a marked car, it was just a car. So short story long, three cops had chased me around the neighborhood, I hit two of them. I, I knocked down a third one. I got thrown into a jail. I, I got thrown in the back of the car. And I'm thinking like, oh my God, I've assaulted three police officers. I'm never coming home. Like, this is it. And I'm in the back of the car and I'm terrified and I don't speak the language and they're talking very fast in French. And then the driver turns back to me and he says, Bad boy, bad boy, what you gonna do? <laughs> and in the deepest part of my being, I said, okay, I'll be okay. This is gonna, <laughs> this will work out. And they really didn't take it personal that, you know, we, we bumped into each other. But they took me into the precinct, and it was like this beautiful, old, gl glorious, like, it looked like from the revolutionary era of you know, France. And it was, they marched me into, this, into the captain's office. They sit me down in front of the captain. And behind the captain is a big poster of like the big scene in Reservoir Dogs with Harvey Keitel and Tim Roth like pointing guns at each other. And I was like, this is working out great. This is gonna be okay. <laughs> so the captain comes in and he says, what would they do to you if you were in America? I said, oh, they would have shot me and thrown me in the river, like, a long time ago. He said, that's right, because we're French and we're, we're human. And he goes, you know, he let me go. <laughs> and I, that's it. I stopped writing graffiti that night. I, it was never going to get better than that, so that was it. I quit. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll just stick around I have no here. other graffiti stories. That's it. <laughs> you can ask Stephen the stories in person. Anybody else? Going once? Well, Go thank you, Stephen, Lori. 
Yeah, Lori. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I owe it all to you, Lori.